Dan was brought up on an estate just outside Brighton in Sussex. He missed a lot of school between years 9 and 11 and became involved in crime. When I was 14, got, with, got in with a group of boys who were criminals, car thieves, and done a lot of other things. And um, I took, they took me up to their house just to meet them. And then that's how I really got into it and started thieving cars and stuff like that. I've, ne I've, I've never seen my dad and I've never lived with my mum. So, and I never had no older brothers or older sisters. The only thing they were, they, they were my aunties sort of thing, but they, they weren't they weren't really a role model to me. So, like, um, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure if it played a part, really, in what I'd, why I'd done it, because I might have just done it anyway, even if I did live with my parents at the time, because my nan brought me up from when I was about six months. His nan supported him throughout his childhood, but when Dan started hanging out with some older boys, he began to steal cars. We didn't nick, like, any, any car. We just nicked a nice car with nice wheels, Nice stuff inside it, like stereos and speakers and everything. And then just jumped in it, drove off, took it to a garage, stripped all the parts off it. But before we actually nicked the car, we knew we were going to sell the parts to. So it was all planned out. We didn't feel we were taking from people because it was just their stuff. It, like, it's insured. It's not like burgling someone's house because it's, in, like, it's insured. So we don't, they don't really lose out. They get the money back. Because the cars we were nicking, they've, they've got a got to have been insured anyway, from like the stuff it had in them. So they weren't not going to be insured, because it'd be too much of a big loss to them if they didn't insure it. We used to get 150 to 250 on a set of wheels. The main part really is all the body kit and everything on it like that. That's the most expensive. I feel guilty now for the people's cars I did steal, because they must have woke up one morning to go to school with their kids and thought, I ain't got a car. When I was younger and committing crimes, I didn't know, I didn't know how, how people felt at the time, when I used to do things to them and take things off them, but now I know how they feel. The law considers all criminal activity also to be antisocial behaviour, although many kinds of antisocial behaviour, like perhaps shouting abuse, is not necessarily a crime. Antisocial behaviour, the legal definition, is any behaviour that causes harassment, alarm or distress, or is likely to. In reality, what that means is that it uh, can be behaviour such as graffiti, uh, shouting, swearing, uh, vandalism, uh, criminal damage, uh, threats and actual violence. So it's quite broad ranging in what it can cover, but the legal definition is harassment, alarm or distress. However, to a degree it's quite subjective. What may cause distress to one person doesn't necessarily cause distress to another. Um, behaviour in one context may not necessarily be antisocial behaviour, uh, whereas in another context it may be. So for instance, if you live in an urban environment, playing your music very loudly till three or four o'clock in the morning is likely to cause harassment, alarm and distress. But if you live in the country with nobody else nearby to you, then obviously you can play your music without it bothering or disturbing anybody else. An antisocial behaviour order is literally a piece of paper that is issued from the court Within the antisocial behaviour order, we can put conditions about what people are prohibited from doing. So we can prohibit people from going to places, being with people, and being out at certain times. I was 16 at the time when I got my ASBO, and I felt quite bad really because I couldn't really go out with my friends because I had an 11 o'clock curfew because I had eight conditions and I couldn't really go out after 11 so and if I did I'd get arrested and get breached so. Well most people when they, when they actually get a curfew they're, they're actually based at one address so the police can actually come around and check but because I didn't have no fixed address at the time they put it to me that 
I'm not, I, weren't, I wasn't allowed to be in a public place after the hours of 11, so I could be at a friend's house, but as long as I weren't outside and been seen by police, been seen by the police, that they can arrest me if I was out after 11, but if I was in anyone else's house, and as long as I didn't leave after 11, they couldn't really do anything. I think what an ASPO tries to do is serve as a reminder to people that actually the behaviour you've been responsible for over the weeks, months, sometimes often years, is actually unacceptable and needs to stop. And it's about making that perpetrator a better person, if you like, and so as there aren't so many victims of his or her behaviour. We, we sometimes have young people particularly not taking ASBO seriously, uh, and they do think of it as a, as a badge of honour, as if it was some, some award. Well, the reality is that they quite quickly realise that actually this is more serious than I thought. There is, there is a real risk that if I breach this order enough times, I'm going to go to, to, to prison, and, it, and it, sadly it does happen. I didn't even, I didn't even have any criminal convictions before I even got the ASBO when they actually imposed it on me. But it's because I got caught with the wrong crowd, hanging around with the wrong crowd and got arrested with the wrong people, that they thought I'd carry on doing it so then they'd keep a close eye on me. That's why they actually gave me the antisocial behaviour, but I didn't actually have a criminal conviction at the time. In relation to young people, often they will come to us after they have a certain degree of criminal behaviour. They are not hardened criminals. What they are are people who have often been in the wrong place at the wrong time and predominantly with the wrong people. Part of what we're trying to do is to draw a line that stops the behaviour that would then move on to harder and harder criminal activity. The ASBO itself is what we call civil order. If they breach and they are found guilty of the breach, then it's actually a criminal offence to breach the order and our powers are considerable in, in punishment terms. In punishment terms, as for a, a young person under 18, we can put them what's called a detention and training order for two years. That basically means uh, custody for a year and a year under licence in the community doing community work. On my second conviction, they were, um, the courts were, that made me do a referral order with youth offending team. It weren't really serious at the time until I got arrested again and then I got a supervision order. And then I had to do community service with the youth offending team, like at Amberley Steam Museum, land railway tracks. And uh, I quite enjoyed that actually, that was, that was all right. But that didn't stop me there, I just kept going. Kept, kept going doing more crimes and more crimes. I was working with Dan um, about three or four years ago. Uh, Dan would have been probably about 14, 15 at the time. He was excluded from school. That kind of gave him a lot of time and that, that meant he was hanging around a lot really. I think he drifted into a, a group of people where he got into a bit of trouble. He started to use drugs. The youth offending team are there, to, I think, to stop people um, committing more crimes and getting themselves into more trouble and try and get them out of trouble before they can get into more trouble. When I was on my antisocial behaviour order, I, um, and I had a curfew at the time, um, I, I actually stole a car, and then one of my mates took the wheel on it. He went off, drove off the car, I didn't know where he went. He come back, and he, I didn't know, but he obviously went up the road, smashed into someone's driveway wall, smashed all that down, come back, and I could see, but I could see where the car was smashed up, but I was, I was so off on, on drugs that I didn't really care. Police car come up behind me. I spun off, went round a roundabout, went down this dead end. So I jumped out the other side. I ran round the back, and um, police were behind me, running, running after me. My mate just stayed there. He got pepper sprayed. He, he, he just had to stay there. And um, I ran up onto this bank, and I didn't think any police saw me. And they, they were running all past me, trying to look for me. And one police officer said, "Daniel." He said, um, "I can see you come out." And I was like, "I shouldn't, shouldn't have said that." So I jumped up, bought with behind these um, shops, jumped through this garden, jumped through these bushes in this garden, because I thought it was like in, in a garden, jumped through the bushes, the main road with a police dog and a police officer standing there. So I just dropped myself to the floor and said, nick me. I ain't getting bitten by no police dog. While I was on my antisocial behaviour order, I, um, 
I got arrested for a few offences, including breach of my curfew. And um, when I went to court, they convicted me. I got four months on tag as well, which then I had two curfews. So, and that was from seven till seven. And I was going, at the time, I was going to work at seven, because I weren't allowed to leave until then anyway. I had to leave at seven, get back at, finish work at five, and because it was in Newhaven, I had to get back from there. And it took about 45 minutes to get back, so I got back about five. Now I got back about six. And then I only had one hour left until I had to be in, so I couldn't really do anything. And when that came off, I still had an 11 o'clock curfew. Because I had the tag for four months, but I still had an 11 o'clock curfew even when they took it off. Tagging is, um, they put a device on your, um, on your ankle and um, it's, it's electronic and they, you, they set a box up in your house. And if you go outside your door after that certain time, they'll, when, you, if you get, when you get back, they'll phone you and ask for um, a reasonable answer why you've been out after that time. And if it's not good enough, they breach you and send you back to court for breaching your curfew. Kept going out thieving just to feed, feed my drug habit. It wasn't really a habit at first, like I only started smoking cannabis at first. And then um, as I got more money, I went on to bigger things, sort of thing. But the only drugs I didn't take really were heroin and crack cocaine. And everything else I'd done. I think Dan's drug use became quite a major factor in the end. And I think that led him to become more and more chaotic and to spend more and more time with his friends who were, would also be using drugs. I mainly got into drugs because my friends were doing it, so I, really, I just wanted to follow them, really, which is a thing I regret now. I do regret doing drugs now. The police should give um, parents more help in catching the drug dealers who sell their children the drugs. None of the parents are going to come together and do it because they're too scared to um, grasp the people up for selling the drugs, so they just get on with it. So that's why they barely ever get caught. I think young people should have more chances. Um, to prove their self because the amount, the amount of people to hang around with when they're younger um, do try and encourage them to do things and like they might not want to do it but they do it at the time and they might regret it when they're older so they, they, I think they should give people more chances, young, younger people more chances. Yeah, I do think it's difficult to clear your name because when you walk, when you walk down the street and um, the police stop you and they um, ask your name and that and they automatically think you're wanted. But I still get pulled over for it and I'm, and I'm not even wanted. I still get pulled over for it, but I never even, I don't even commit crimes now, but they don't know that, so they still think you're the same person. The great myth is that all young people cause antisocial behaviour. The majority of the work that we do is not with young people. The thing within Dan, I don't quite know how to describe it, but that thing within Dan that he, he actually wanted to change, in order for a person to change, I think they have to be motivated to do so. And I think he always had that in him. He knows maybe that what he was doing was, was either wrong or he wasn't happy with it, or he wanted to make it better. And he knew that maybe he was letting down the people around him. When, when I was younger and committing crimes, I didn't know how people felt and when I used to do things to them and take things off them. So I, I've got loads of guilt for that now. I'd never do it ever again. I do feel like I'm a good guy now, but I know, I know how bad I was in the past, but I've, I have changed now and I am much better than what I used to be. But I'm, I'm much better now, much, much better.